Welcome to Gabble. I'm Don. And I'm Jonathan. And we are so thrilled that you joined us once again. Yeah, we're back again. We're back again. Don, what do we got this week? This week, uh, we want to talk about something that all of us play a part in or have uh, at our disposal. And that is, I think, we want to talk about pillows. Okay. You know, hey, let's, why not? In this time when everybody's doing more sleep and, uh, uh, or you should be sleeping more, trying to... Yeah, I'm definitely sleeping more. I am. I am as well. Um, during the COVID-19, I, I find myself sleeping a lot more. And uh, and so it brings up a great topic of, let's talk about pillows. Why not? And no, we're not talking about the pillow around our guts. Uh, oh, but, snap. Yeah, okay. So um, I guess we could launch right into so, this. So where do you want to start? You want to start with the early pillow where yeah, pillows started? Yeah, let's talk about where the pillow started. Um, which would you like to take a, a, a guess or a, a venture as to when you think the pillow was first brought into being? Well, I imagine people have been using pillows for a long time because it's more comfortable to sleep with your head slightly elevated. So your spine is straighter, I, I guess, right? Yeah, that would, that would make good sense. Uh, by the way, uh, we're glad to have Brayden, our research assistant with us here today. And so he's going to be helping us look things up. Um, but yeah, pillows actually got their start. Um, the history of the pillow dates back to around 7,000 BC. Oh, wow. Yeah, way back. And uh, it was first found in ancient Mesopotamia. And the pillows, which would be modern day Iraq, mm -hmm. and the pillows that they used back in that day were made of stone. Oh, we've come a long way. Yes. They weren't comfortable, obviously. Um, but comfort was not their purpose. Can well, you take a guess at what the purpose of the original pillow was? Um, so I remember learning something about maybe they put them by the campfire to get them warm. Well, that right, that, yeah, that could be. Because they like, stayed warm a long time. There, there's one. You also mentioned, you know, elevating the head, mm -hmm. so you're, you keep know, your spine straighter. Yeah. yeah, but the function of the stone pillow was to prevent insects from crawling into mouths, noses, and ears. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it was, um, they they would lift their heads up to get them off the ground because that's where the insects crawled. And so only the wealthy city, uh, citizens could afford, with the high price of stone, only these wealthy you know, citizens could afford them. And so um, in ancient Egypt, the head was believed to be the seat of like spiritual life. Mm -hmm. So they hold, hold on a second. So they, they made these pillows so people wouldn't eat insects. Well, yeah. So while you're I, sleeping, like your mouth is now, open I don't, and, I don't know if it's true, but I've heard that there uh, people eat like eight spiders a year on average during their sleep. Is, I, is I, that true? I've heard, I've heard something like that, 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 that makes good sense to me. And I've heard of I always bugs. thought it was a myth. I no, didn't think I've there heard was of any bugs truth like to it. crawling. Well, think if you and I slept on a dirt floor all the time, think about all the bugs that would be crawling all over you. And so I guess I they, guess. Yeah, they so they wanted to sleep with their heads on a rock or a pillow at that time. And they did that to keep as many bugs out of their mouth and ears and nose as possible. It's Man. yeah, kind of strange. And so then the Egyptian pillows they started they started making their pillows out of different materials like marble, ivory, ceramic, stone, and wood. All these really all, hard all these really hard things. <laughs> yeah. And they um they felt like it had religious meaning. So they felt like where you lay where you placed your head, um, it would help to keep bad spirits away. And so they used all these different materials. And uh, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, what what the ancient pillows look like? Uh, almost they didn't even. It's hard to imagine, but they almost look like a kind of like a head chopping yeah, block. Looks, yeah, it looks like a, a half moon up on a little pedestal. If you, if you Google ancient pillow, you'll you'll see it. Yeah. So let's see here. What have we got from Braden here? Lucky, luckily, all of us. The fact that people have swallowed eight spiders in their sleep yearly isn't true. Oh, it's a uh, myth. It's a myth. Okay, all not right. even close. Apparently, the myth claims that people eat spiders during their sleep, and yeah, it's not true. I I know that I've felt like I swallowed maybe a spider, but it probably just doesn't happen. What was that source? It says it's not true. What was the source? Google. Okay. Oh, Google. oh Scientific American. There it is. Oh, got it. Yeah. All right, there you go. 
So then the ancient Chinese civilization started using different materials. They started using like stone, still mm -hmm. wood, but then they moved to bamboo, bronze, there, there we go, porcelain, bamboo. jade. They, they were using <laughs> jade, and um, and o only for the princes. Yes, but they felt like there was um, that each different material had a health benefit for the people that laid their heads on it. Yeah, so I mean, could you imagine laying your head on a piece of marble? Wow, that that would hurt. Yeah, you're, um, what are you absorbing? Like, oh, yeah, I got this marvelous idea from this marble. And they also felt like Doubtful. the um, the idea of a hard pillow brought health and intellect to the person that was laying on it. So, but then the ancient Greeks and Rome Romans, they're the ones that ended up bringing in uh, left behind the idea of the hard pillow and started bringing in the soft pillow. Okay, and they so started they're, they're using crazy like enough to make coliseums, but they were smart enough to think of soft pillows. Exactly. So they started using like cotton, reeds, straw, there we go. down feathers, stuff like that. So we get our idea of the pillow. Do you like down from the? No, I do not. Pillows? No, I don't because it like my head sinks into it too much. It comes around my face. I, I feel almost claustrophobic. Plus, I'm a side sleeper. Mm -hmm. So like when I sink into it, like half my face feels covered. I feel like I can't breathe half. You of know, it. down comforters are hit and miss with me because some of them. They, they still leave the little spine and the dumb feathers. Yes, and they poke. yes, like, poke you. Yeah, no, I agree with that. They have to be inside of a down uh, comforter cover. Yes, so I agree. What's the point of having a three hundred dollar comforter if you have to put it inside of another thing? Yo. So then, sorry, um, sorry to get off track. No, there. no, no, it's all good. So um, in Europe, in the Middle Ages, pillows were not particularly popular. The soft pillow was a status symbol, and many people couldn't even afford them. And King, this is crazy. Just go kill some chickens. Yeah, there you go. King Henry VIII banned the use of soft pillows for anyone except for pregnant women. What his thinking was, well, don't ask Henry me. Henry VIII, didn't he have like nine wives? So he, he killed them all or they, something. His wives wanted all the pillows, so he needed them for them. Yes. <laughs> and so once more, by, by the 16th century, these pillows were becoming more widespread but the the stuffing in the inside this is gross the stuffing oh. in the inside had to be regularly changed due to mold oh. and vermin whoa yeah because of straw and all that kind of stuff they were having problems with rodents etc wow i can't i can't sleep uh, why couldn't you sleep oh there's a rat there in was my a pillow. rat in my pillow gnawing on my ear like oh the good news is my earwax is all cleaned out <laughs> you're gross so in this 19th century with the beginning of the industrial revolution that's when pillows became common in almost every home. And so that- Wait, wait, what was the date that they finally became common? In the 19th century. Wow, that is way later. Yeah, so in the 1800s, they finally, the industrial revolution finally kind of brought them into being to where everybody the started. Man the common man it. had a pillow. Wow. Yeah, so um, if you lived before that time, you you didn't have you didn't have a pillow. It's, it's just amazing to me. I guess that, you could sleep on your arm. When I sleep in a sleeping bag, I sleep on my arm. Yeah, yeah. I could see that. Yeah. So um, that that kind of brings us to, to you know, the 18, 1900s. Okay. And, okay. So once we get to the 1900s, it's just a matter of making the pillow better, right? People are just, we got innovators and trying to look at this pillow and say, hey, what are the problems? How can we make this better? And then. Well, yeah, because the industrial revolu uh, revolution, you kind of find that happening with just about everything. If you've heard our other episodes you hear about you know they were trying to make the invention better of, breakfast they you know yeah so you know, breakfast the, the problem was it took way too long to make and they're trying to come up with something that could be made very quickly no that's that actually that was a byproduct of their original goal their goal was to make something that was in uh, in accordance with uh, their belief system yes that's true as well right they wanted something that didn't give them lustful desires and whatever and the mm -hmm. stuff they believed at the battle creek sanitarium at the, the seventh day adventist yes uh, ellen white founded all that and all and all and then the byproduct was people bought it a lot because it was so fast yes have breakfast instantly instead well, of making it for three hours and you find that whole time frame i mean that's when they were you had people inventing uh, you know, yellow mustard and and ice cream cones and Dr Pepper and Coca Cola and, and the yeah. So you got these and inventors the car and the and the and the airplane. They and, invent you know. things you didn't know you need, and then the other guys they find solutions to problems. Yeah. So that's like inventors and innovators. Talk to us a little, a little bit about that because I know that you've mentioned before. Well, like about Coca Cola, they invented something we didn't know we wanted. Right. It's just people became addicted to the caffeine, and then they realized, hey, this gives me a little boost, and now I need it. And they invented a, a product. So basically, an in, what's the difference between an innovator and an inventor? Uh, I would say my 
definition would be an inventor invents something new like Coca-Cola and an innovator takes something that has a problem and makes it better. Like we're going to talk about later on okay. with the improvements on the pillow that made one guy really popular. Yeah. Or but let me think of something else that was like automobiles. They just, one guy, Ford invented them, right? Yes. The automobile. And then innovators took that and said, hey, this thing needs to go faster. So like and Mr. Then, Buick and Mr. Yes. Oldmobile and, then, and those men. Um, well, the, uh, whoever, I forget the gentleman's name, is an Italian name who made um, the first Italian supercars and they were making these race cars to go fast and for the racetrack. And they yes. were dominating the Le Mans racetrack until I think 1966 was the first year an American company won the Le Mans. Got it. So basically the, an innovator is somebody who's taking something that's been used before and making it much, yes, much finding better. finding problems and finding solutions to it. Yeah, that's, I like that. I, uh, one of my uh, distant family members was, uh, he was trying to invent something like, um, or patent. He was trying to patent something. Okay. And then the, the patent guy told him, he's like, you know what? In order to get a patent, you have to find a solution to a problem is how is one way to find a patent. So he, what he did, he identified a problem mm -hmm. to submit it for the patent. He said, this is the problem. This chalk goes to dust too quickly. I'm trying to make it formulate more hard. And he, he had his whole thing all drawn out. He got the patent. But the, the patent lawyer told him, you have to identify the problem and then show us, illustrate how your product is going to fix the problem or resolve the problem. Yeah, and, 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 and Braden, I do agree with you. Uh, he slipped us a note that says Steve Jobs was an innovator and Thomas Edison is an inventor. And I, and I, I would agree with that. Steve Jobs took a, what right. was already in existence and he improved upon it. Whereas Thomas Edison took something that was non-existent, mm -hmm. and, no, nobody and, believed him. Everybody thought he was crazy. What was it, ten thousand attempts or yeah, something, yeah. something ridiculous? Yeah, like that. Ten, I think it was ten thousand attempts to make the light bulb. Yeah, and his assistant even didn't believe that he would do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what's crazy is what's interesting now is retrospectively, you look at these people that were quote unquote crazy, and then they they're the ones that came up with the the most. Um, affect the long-lasting inventions like yes. Albert Einstein, Nikola Tesla. All of these guys that that really you would never did you expect know it. Nikola Tesla uh, he predicted that there would be fuelless airplanes and there would be he said something like when wireless is perfected we'll be able to see someone and speak with them as if they were right in front of us even though they are hundreds of miles away and cell phones weren't thought of yet no. obviously this what? is hundreds of years ago and then yeah. he would over a hundred years ago oh it was one thousand okay. one thousand attempts perfect Tom for, the, says. for the light bulb so. Here we are 130 years later from Nikola Tesla, and we have FaceTime, and we can see people that right is, in front of us and talk amazing. to them right in front, like they're in front of us. And then he said fuelless airplanes, which sounded absolutely crazy, but just in 2017, they made a solar-powered airplane that made a trip completely around the world. Wow. I, I didn't read that. I, I wish I would have seen that article. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was just, it was a short article that just said, "Hey, we got this solar powered airplane made around the world." I didn't read the whole thing; I just mm -hmm. skimmed. But I thought that was really neat. It is. Well, that does bring us to to kind of a, a topic within a topic, and that is a, a gentleman by the name of Mike Lindell. And I'm curious whether oh, you yeah. would, I'm curious whether you'll consider him innovator. an inventor, in, an innovator or inventor. Say yeah, he's an innovator. Okay, so Mike Lindell, um, from my research, uh, kind of had, he had a rough beginning. He um, he's the inventor. The majority of his life was rough beginning. It, yeah, that's exactly it. He uh, I believe he was born in sixty one or sixty two, and uh, his parents divorced when he was seven. You have to think back in in the sixties, uh, families just didn't get divorced, and so he was kind of an outcast from the start. Well, the no fault divorce was started in the United States in what mid sixties, something early? like that. Yeah. yeah. So he was. Um, he was kind of an outcast because uh, fi fi find out if that's true for me. Find out when the no fault divorce was passed. Thank you. Um, so, so his parents get divorced. He's seven years old, and um, he grows up kind of as a misfit. And then you you start finding um, he go he does go to college. But uh, do you know how, how long he went to college, Jonathan? Uh, I think he went for a little less than two years and dropped out. Okay, so so he's basically he's a dropout. He's a, mm -hmm. um, by 1986, he's you know in his 20s, and he's only had two jobs. He worked at a drive-in movie theater, and then he worked at a grocery store. And if I'm not mistaken, you may know better, but I think he got fired from the job at the grocery store. He did. He got fired from his second job that he had. He yeah. was, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, poor guy. <laughs> yeah, he was just kind of a he was kind of a, a wreck to start, and then 
Um, he gets into all this stuff. Like well, at, he, one, at one point in 1986 or, or roughly in that he was in his 20s, he he owed the mafia over $20,000. 1970. So uh, what what year was that for the no-fault divorce? 1970. 1970. Okay. So he close. Yeah, it was very close. Um, so he, Mike Lindell owed the mafia $20,000 because of some football bets. Oh, and man. they actually came and came to his porch, Those to are... his house to kill him. And? And, and I don't know, he must have paid his debt or talked him out Ooh, of it or something. I, I really don't. the silver tongue, Mike They're, Lindell. I, I guess. He crashed his motorcycle. He, this is crazy. He fell asleep while he was skydiving. I don't know if maybe well, it was. I think. You told you mentioned this to me before that he fell asleep while skydiving. Now I did hear. I know he was experimenting or not experiment. He was doing drugs since he was like fifteen years old. Yeah, and he mentions being awake for several days, ten days, twelve days, fourteen days. Yes, at you, one yeah. point. Yeah, and then that the turning point. That one. That one turning point. He was awake for fourteen days. Yes. So I would guess. Maybe he was awake for eight days or something, and then he went skydiving. That that could be, yeah. Because so. I can't think of any other way you could fall asleep while skydiving. I can't I've either. been skydiving, and it is a blast. And to me, it wasn't scary at all, but it was. I definitely wouldn't be able to fall asleep. Well, the only other thing that I could see is maybe if there was a rush of oxygen somehow or lack of oxygen. Oh yeah, definitely. Maybe, if you're above thirteen thousand feet for a while, yeah, you'll you'll get that hy would hypoxia. Be, yeah, that would be the but only thing that I could think of too. More Everybody's symptoms are different, but the majority of people experience delirium long before they they, they pass out. Yeah, I don't know, but um, so he he actually and in one of his skydiving jumps, his primary parachute didn't open. Oh man! I mean, so this guy he's had, he has all these crazy stories. His primary parachute didn't open. His alternate did open. Thank the good Lord for that. Ooh. And so he's uh, he was born and he's living in in Minnesota and. He does leave for just a couple of months, I think two months. He moves to Vegas to be a card counter, and then he moves back to Minnesota. And in the middle of all this, he gets involved in the drug community. And uh, by 1984, he was a functioning addict. He basically was just doing bucket loads of cocaine. And he's just a young man. He's you know maybe 23, 24. Mm -hmm. And he, he's bought a, a small town bar and so in his bar, it was just a place where that was where he was just doing constant cocaine. Wow. And so, so he's functioning enough to, to be able to have some business business planning and purchase a bar. Yes. But like all, most addictions, they'll take over your life. And that's your that's all you want to do is that addiction. And yeah. And he didn't he at some point he so he was a terrible alcoholic as well um, before before he got into cocaine. So he's an alcoholic. He's a cocaine addict. And he's. He's functioning. He's got a he's got a family. Um, you know, he's married. He's got some kids, but he he ends up losing all of this, and then it gets worse because he also ends up getting into crack. Now, there's a study out, and the study says that an alcoholic, um, somebody addicted to alcohol, if they are a habitual drinker, it takes 28 years for alcohol to affect your life slash health. Oh, I thought you were going to say like have cirrhosis of the liver or something at that no, point. No, but, but at 20, it takes 28 years roughly average for the alcohol to affect your health or your life. Okay. Okay. This is, this is a study out there. And then they say, um, so 28 years for alcohol. They say it takes three and a half years for cocaine to affect your health. Consistently doing it three and a half years. They say crack, it takes two weeks. Wow. Two weeks. That's how addicted. They say that um, by your second time, you are fully addicted. Now, have you ever heard of the, the rat park theory? No. Huh. The Talk to me about it. Rat park theory is this, this, I forget the gentleman's name, but there's an experiment. And it... In order to be scientifically correct, it has to be peer reviewed, and then the peers have to be able to recreate the experiment, and it has to be successful, and then they scientifically conclusive. That's okay. typically how it works. Yeah. But this, they tried to recreate it, and it wasn't scientifically conclusive. Okay. But still, it's an interesting study. This guy looked at addiction in rats because we see we determine how addictive a substance is partly in part because how rats react. Okay. So what they'll do is they'll take a rat and they'll give them like methamphetamine. 
and then they'll give him regular water. And the rat tastes both waters, and then he'll say, the rat will only drink the methamphetamine water, mm. and he will thirst to death uh, trying to get the methamphetamine. Okay. Beyond that, they will apply electric shock to the rat when he tries to drink the meth water, uh-huh. and he will still drink the meth water even though he's getting shocked. To the point, it shocks him so much, it seizes the rat because their their muscles contract so much. That same rat, he, um, so even though they're feeling pain, they're still going to drink the meth water. It's nuts, it's bro. It's because of addiction. So this guy said, you know what? Um, I think this rat was just lonely and depressed, and that's why he got addicted to this drug. So he created what he called Rat Park. Mm-hmm. He got a bunch of rats together so they weren't isolated and alone. Mm-hmm. And so they could play with their little toys and go through the tunnels and have families. So he he gave the same exer- experiment. He said, here's some meth water. Here's some regular water. He said, all the rats tasted of the meth, meth water, but none of them got addicted. Mm-hmm. They would only live off the regular water they didn't like the meth water so his conclusion was if rats are lonely and depressed they taste of the meth water they say oh man this is the only thing that makes you feel different and feel good about life whereas the rats that had friends and had families they were happier and they didn't need that meth to feel happy because it got in the way of hey i can't think straight as opposed to hey this is the only thing that makes me feel different and does that make sense it does make sense and um so I, I yeah, would if you, guess if you Google that so Rat Park, there's lots of talks on it. I, I would guess that so many people that are addicted to substance um, and have substance abuse issues would probably say that somewhere it starts with insecurity or oh, bad things in their lives. Yeah. or you know, this scam guy, he always mentions people that go to the hospital. He says people break an arm and then they go to the hospital and then they they receive uh, painkillers. Mm-hmm. He says some of those people get addicted. Yes. I think the people that get addicted are lonely or depressed people. That and then the people that have family lives and things, they don't get addicted because they're pretty much happy with life or happier. Yeah. Speaking of which, do you know where heroin was created? I know we're off on drugs right now. We'll get back to pillows in a second. But do you where? Know? No, I don't. Okay. So heroin was created or invented by the Bayer Aspirin Company. What? Yes. And what it was created for is to cure alcoholism. Wow. Yeah. So basically, hey, here, you're addicted to alcohol. Take this heroin so you'll be addicted to this. I, yeah. I, I, I don't give what the theory was behind that. Yeah there's, yeah, there's a medicine called methadone, which they give people to wing them off meth. But people get addicted to methadone as well. Yeah. And then it goes the other way, too. People will take pills, get addicted to pills, and they'll go to methadone from oxycodone, oxycodone, oxycodone. Yeah, it, it's nuts. It's a messed up. So basically, thing. this guy, so Michael Lindell, he's addicted to to alcohol then he's addicted to cocaine then he starts flirting with crack and gets addicted to crack he loses everything he loses his house he loses his family he loses his kids he loses his bars everything it's all gone and he's living in it's the a pretty typical drug story unfortunately yes and so he's living um and in in his sister's basement and he's he, he's getting so just i mean he's getting out of how control. long was he addicted for Ooh, I don't remember. I don't. I don't His have marriage that. lasted how long? 20 years? 20 years. And he was addicted the entire time. I believe so. So I think he was addicted for a grand total of 28 years. I think you're right. Longer. Yeah, something like that. Um, and he's he decides that he feels like he was given a, a vision or an idea that he was supposed to start or invent this pillow. Oh, that's right. He has a dream, right? And yes. He, yeah, I remember that story. That's a cool story. So, but he's but or kind of a weird story. It actually. is kind of. Yeah. He says he woke up and then he had written, like, slept, walked to the kitchen and wrote my pillow. My down. pillow, like, all over the place or something. Yeah. And, his, and his daughter walked in, like, eleven year old daughter, and she's like, "What are you doing, he Dad?" Said, I'm gonna make this thing called my pillow. Yeah, and she was like, "You're kind of off your rocker." I think she said, "That's random." And yes, walks something away. like exactly. And so he's basically. He's he's inventing this pillow, but don't forget he's still addicted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that was addicted. in two thousand four. Yeah, so he decides that he is going to invent this pillow, but there's several things that he he wants this pillow to be or do, and um, but what's really funny about it is he invents this pillow, and there I guess some of the things that he is. He's been, trying to find solutions to problems, right? Yes. So so he wanted his pillows to, like, the, he wanted them to be washable. Right. So he wanted them to be washable because he realized 
you can ruin a lot of pillows by putting them in the washer. Uh, down, we talked about down pillows. You can ruin those, putting them in the washer. Uh, yeah, most certainly, yeah. Another problem was they were mostly all foreign that he saw, so he wanted his pillow to be made in America. Okay. And well, I know another thing is he wanted his pillow to be adjustable. To where like it, you could adjust it to different you know different size shoulders etc neck sleep or back sleepers and side then sleepers the final thing which is the thing that aggravates me the most is he wanted a pillow that would last yes because pillows are they're not the same after just six months just six months you feel like you gotta I, go buy another one when i was researching when i looked it up just now it was it says the average lifespan of a pillow is four years four years no, no way. way no <laughs> no way maybe a year yes no i totally agree with that so it took so him he finds solutions to these problems so i think that makes this guy an innovator yeah that makes sense it took him one year to invent to get this pillow right and so he, so he had that dream in 2004 so now we're 2008 right and then what the first thing he does is makes the pillow and i think the first thing he did correct me if i'm wrong doesn't he start with a kiosk yes his buddy says hey man well, since you're having such a hard time with this pillow thing why don't you try a kiosk well that was because he went to all these different places to try to sell it and nobody everybody was like no we're not going to sell your pillow and so he yeah, went to it, all the box stores and all these places, and they're like, no, we're not selling your well, pillow. Well, it makes sense to me because he, you're, he's saying he has a pillow that has a 10-year warranty. I don't know if I mentioned that, but it has a 10-year warranty. People are thinking that is the oddest thing to yeah, have like, a pillow. It's, That's not going to be a good pillow. People just buy new pillows every year. Exactly. And so they basically just brushed him off. And so – like you were saying, his, his buddy said, "Why don't you start a kiosk?" And he's like, ah, "What's a kiosk? I don't even know how to spell." I, yeah, he what didn't are you even saying? remember how to spell it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So he was like, "Okay." So in this kiosk in this mall, he only sells forty pillows. Forty pillows. Okay. But one of those forty customers happened to own a, or, or run. He was the run. He ran a um, home show. So this guy that runs the home show finds Mike's contact information, calls him, I think, a month or two later. Do you know how he got his contact information? I don't know. Okay, this is funny. So he comes, he buys the pillow uh -huh. in, in the, you know, at the kiosk. Then he comes back and he asks Mike for a business card. But Mike didn't have money for business cards at that point. He, he was too poor. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was too poor for business cards. So he, he lies to the guy. And he says, oh, I'm out of business cards. And he writes his info down on a piece of paper and hands wow. the guy the piece of paper. So, yeah, so that's, now this we get guy to this calls point. Mike yes. uh, a couple months, about, about a month later, and he says, Mike, did you invent this pillow? Mike says, yeah, I sure did. And he's like, listen, man, I run this home show, and I will give you a spot to sell your pillows. Your pillow has changed my life, helped me sleep. Mike says, really? He's like, yeah, man, I want you to have a spot in the home show. I think you could do really well. So then that's what Mike does. He goes to the home show and he has a little table and he has his pillow and he's showing people the pillow and he's really introverted because he was a drug addict for the last 20 or I think at this point he had just gotten off of drugs. Okay. And he's, so he's a drug addict for 28 years and he's having a hard time interacting with these people. And No, he's still addicted. Oh, he's still addicted yeah, to this point, 2008? He, yeah, it's two, so, um, so he was addicted for another two years. He was addicted till 2009. Okay, yep. until another year. So he's trying to sell these pillows, but he actually does pretty well. When he's standing behind the table demonstrating the pillow, it's like, this is the pillow that has a 10-year warranty. Like at the, at the it's home gonna show. help you sleep. Yeah, at the yes. home show behind the table, yes. And so he was able to interact with people and sell a bunch of pillows, and that's really what was the thing that got him a big push in the very beginning. Okay, so like he he, <coughs> so he happened to sell to one one out of the forty pills he sold from the kiosk landed him this home show, which really got him a lot more publicity and word of mouth. Okay, so he um, and I believe that what was the next step? Was the next step the infomer infomercial? Well, yes and no because he has to have an intervention. Oh, and, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So 2009. Talk, to, talk to us a little bit about the intervention. So I don't know a whole lot about it other than he was awake for 14 days straight and he's talking to the people he buys his drugs from. Yeah. And he's OK. So he's in downtown Minneapolis. Yeah. And then he's he sees in the dregs. I mean, it's the total, total worst place of Minneapolis you can be in. And then he goes to the, the dealer to buy some more drugs, and then he sees two other dealers. And well, he says, I, I didn't know you guys knew each other. What are all three of you doing here yes. together in one spot? And they said, Mike, we're here to stop you. Well, part we're, of the we're deal not going to sell to you. Part of the problem was he was hiding out because there was a warrant out for his arrest. Oh, man. And so that's why he was in this, this dreg of society where he was, was he was doing his drugs. He was on this high. He was buying. He was going to buy more drugs, but he was hiding out, trying to to stay away from the law because there was a warrant out. 
So, so the version of the story I heard was Mike was always talking about how he's going to help these guys someday. Someday my pillows are going to be big and I'm going to come back and I'm going to help all you guys. Yes. So these three guys, Mike is telling these three dealers all the time, I'm going to help you someday. And so the dealers hold them to it. This one, they all get together, have this little intervention. It says, Mike, you keep saying you're going to help us one day. Why don't you just stop now? You've been awake for 14 days. We're not selling to you. And anybody that works for us is not selling to you either. The largest, the three largest drug dealers in Minneapolis did, a, did their own in, intervention. That is crazy yeah, to me. Yeah, that's a weird story. It's like, like, okay, we want to sell drugs to everybody, but we don't want to sell to you because we just, we don't want you to buy it because you are, you're supposed to help us in the future. And right now you're yeah, destroying exactly. your own life. So yeah. basically stop. That, that's, that's just Yeah, nuts. if you destroy your own life, you can't help us later That's so it. it was a little selfish still yes but anyway they don't sell to him and he goes out and tries to buy drugs but the word had gotten out don't sell the mic so nobody would sell the mic he comes back to that room and by this time there's only one dealer left i think yes and he tells now, him how that work out for you buddy the, here's the crazy part about that too is in the long run two of those dealers would end up they actually in 2017 still worked for him wow yep uh, uh, legitimately in his pillow business so he basically so i know he attributes this to becoming a christian but did he did he go to church or how did he where did his his religion start i i don't really don't know, know. i don't know because i do know once he got clean in 2009 that's when he started the infomercial or it had the infomercial okay let's talk about the infomercial because that's very interesting so the infomercial is pretty interesting because he mike like i said was very awkward with people yeah he couldn't talk he yeah, wasn't a very good talker so he's doing this infomercial and they do eight takes of this <laughs> of the infomercial where they're recording him he re, he's reading from a teleprompter this is my pillow this is the warranty this is the things that it solves and the, the producer or whoever is running the show, mm -hmm. he didn't say this to Mike, but he told some people around him. He said, this is the worst guy I have ever seen on any of these sets. I read that same thing. He was just basically like, this guy is, he does not belong doing an infomercial. Yeah, he, he has no business. He can't even this. read a teleprompter. And so Mike finally says, hey guys, can I get a table? And so he's thinking back to the home show when he had a pillow in front ah, of him. He, he was confidence. really good at demonstrating and just showing, hey, I've been sleeping on pillows all my life. And this is I haven't had good sleep. And that's why I made this. And this is going to help you sleep and help him next day straight and all this stuff. So he gets a, a table and then he starts demonstrating the pillow. And then he doesn't read the teleprompter at all and just ad libs the entire, the entire infomercial. infomercial taping. Wow. And that was take nine. And then they used take number nine. And it so, worked. And they aired to like 3 a.m. or something? Yeah. Okay. So that was October. It aired October 7th, 2011 at 3 a.m. in the morning. Mind you, Mike Lindell is still living in his sister's basement. Mm -hmm. At this point. And he, infomercials, he finds out later, don't typically work. They don't he typically work. He says people yeah. go, he says companies, small companies use infomercials right before they go to like some box stores before they die. Hmm. Well, he basically, at this point, he has... But around, it worked for Mike. It worked for Mike because he had, at this point, in October of 2011, he had 10 employees, I want to say. Um, and 40 days later, not 40 weeks, not 40 months. 40 days. 40 days later, he had 500 Whoa. employees. He went that from 10 some exponential growth. to 500 in 40 days. Man. He went from living in his sister's basement, having virtually nothing, to being worth over $300 million, all because of pillow. Yeah, and this is that's crazy. So he just over, basically overnight success with yes. this. Virtually, yeah. I mean, within 40 days. You know, it's similar to the Coca-Cola story and our other stories. These guys, I think some similarities looking at our past stories, they mm -hmm. just really persevered through failure. And eventually they found something that worked because Mike had other failed business ventures before the pillow. He tried a landscaping business and he tried a few other companies. Yes, I totally agree. I think that there's um, there's something to the effect and, and, you know, that the fact that these guys, they. So where's Mike at today? He sold to this date, what, 46 million? 46 million, million pillows Man. from the last that I saw. 46 million pillows. Um, he's pretty controversial now because he's, you know, he's a, he's. He's kind of he's, political he's, and religious. He's political. And, he supports yeah. Trump, and he's a 
very he's very held some very controversial ideas. Yes, but I I um. But still, his business practices. There's something about a guy that keeps getting knocked down, but keeps getting back up. Yeah. And I know that's and only kind of, in America you can go from you know as the, as the phrase goes, rags to riches, right? Yes, with within matter the of opportunities days. Opportunities for anybody. You don't have to be born a royal. You you are. You can be a drug addict, crack addict, and then get clean and and, and come have back. A, yeah. Forty six million dollar. Uh, yeah. Was he worth now three hundred million dollars? Is that what you said? Three. He's worth three hundred million. Three hundred right million dollars. And it, and think about it. He did. He had not even voted so until in, until the twenty sixteen election. Oh yeah. He, he was never voted. He was completely apolitical before. Yeah. Yeah. He had like no. He had no concept of politics. At politics all. or really even business in many ways. But this guy just. He he just said, "Hey, you can't knock me out. I'm just going to keep coming back." He had a great idea, and he said, "There's a way to to fix this problem. Mm -hmm. Let's let's fulfill. You know, everybody's problem is is the pillow sinks down. You can't get one that fits you. You can't get one that stays cool. Well, and all I this stuff. I understand the like the company's apprehension of starting something like that because if you were a tire manufacturer and you made tires of like." 90% rubber and your tires lasted 10 times longer than traditional tires, it'd be really hard to sell your tires because they'd be outrageously expensive. Yes, yes. Now, I will say in my research, there's something I want to do. I want to go buy a MyPillow. Yeah, I know. I, I, know. I really did. After I it read it It sounds like we're pitching for this, but, uh, we're, but not. we're not. We're I, just I, looking for interesting stories. And yeah. like I like you just said, man, researching this makes me want to try one. I, I really do. Because right now I'm buying new pillows every, every year or so. I, and from everything I'm reading, everybody's saying, it did change my life. It how, changed my way of are sleeping. They? How I, much? I have no. How clue much are my pillows? Yeah. Right okay, now. Our here research in assistant, here we go. So he goes from 2008 to 2020, which is now nothing to being worth $300 million. That's it, incredible. It's incredible. And and there again, I mean, he goes from crack addict and and now he's, he's I mean, worldwide known just yeah. as a man who took a great idea and said, let's run with this. And um, I don't know, it just, it's phenomenal. I, I personally, I, I, I want to look into one of these pillows. And yeah, I, if you listen to Mike, he he uh, he attributes a lot of it to his faith. To, he does. He glorifies God with he it. He yeah. really does with with every part of what he's doing, and and you have to admire and respect that somebody Absolutely. that sticks to their guns and says, you know what? Well, in the you in may the, agree in the or you may not now, agree, but you know what? This is what I feel helped me, and this is what I'm going to do. Yeah, and I think it's important to. That's brave, in my opinion, because a lot of people attack him for that. Yes, I in, totally in today's agree. world, you know. And and yet he just sticks to his guns. Sticks and that, to his there's guns. That's there's right. something about that. You know, my I think my kids put some glue on my guns because I'm not sure. I I asked them about it and they said they didn't, but I'm pretty sure they did. I'm sticking to my guns. <laughs> 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 By the way, my pillow forty dollars thirty nine ninety nine. Okay, that's not bad. What are no. we? Uh, was it April? April twenty twenty. The forty dollars. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I'll try one. Yeah, you and me both. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Well, well, that's all I have, Don. Do you have anything else? No, that's all Man. I have today. Well, that was fun. Very interesting. So yeah. Let's uh, let's do this again so, next week. So, hey, guys, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to rate us five stars. We love reading the reviews, so don't forget to leave us a review as well. And if you're listening on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, or anything else, don't forget to follow us or subscribe so you are, you are in tune for our next episodes. We love doing this, and we'll be back next week with another episode. Also, thank you to our producers and our research assistant. We do appreciate it. Shout out to everybody. Yeah. Adios.